everybody. I'm Lindsay Parker from Yahoo Entertainment, and it is my honor to virtually welcome today the legendary producer, songwriter, and musician David Foster, the star of the new documentary Off the Record with the director, Barry Averich. Uh, we'll try to direct this. I, I know we're not doing this in person because of what's going on right now, but it's wonderful to get a chance to speak with you this way. How are you guys doing? All great. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks for, uh, yeah, thanks for doing this. So uh, since I've got both of you, I think the obvious place to start with uh, regarding off the record is how you guys came together, like Barry, like why uh, this subject fascinated you and David, like why you were willing to, uh, you know, put it all out there. It's, you know, it can be very vulnerable. Some of the things you talk about in the film. How did this partnership come together? May, can I just answer that first? Because I'm sure Barry has a better answer than me. I know he does. But my answer <laughs> simply this because I've been asked this before like why now why a documentary the simple answer is nobody ever asked before so when Barry and Bell Media and Randy and Jeffrey uh, said hey we think this is a good idea and Barry of being of such a claim I was like yeah hell who wouldn't want a documentary about their life that's my answer and, and mine segues from that I mean when they brought the idea to me I, I said well how many documentaries have there been on David Foster I mean he is Canada's Quincy Jones. He's the world's David Foster. Uh, I couldn't believe that uh, his legacy hadn't been celebrated yet. And and just to add to that, the more I researched him, I realized I'd made a film in 2005 called The Last Mogul about Lou Wasserman. And David, David, thank you, David Brown, who produced Jaws and the Sting, said that Lou had the entire equation of the business in his head. And David has the entire equation of show business in his head. It's not just a producer in the studio. He just understands everything in cinematic terms. And that blew me away. And our first meeting was watching him do his one-man show in a theater with a huge audience. And I said, this, this is not a, a, a behind-the-scenes guy. I, so I, I was, he had me at hello. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so many stories in this film. I imagine Barry was kind of daunting for you to get, and you couldn't get all of them in a documentary, you know, all of the people David has worked with, but the, I definitely want to lightning round some of the the uh, important stories that stood out to me, some things I learned, because also a lot of them are about some awesome women, but before we talk about Barbara and Natalie and Whitney and Celine, and I do also want to talk about an awesome woman, Kat McPhee, because I overheard uh, just now, David, yesterday, the day, be the day before this interview was taped, was your anniversary? That is right. And who? And they said it wouldn't last. <laughs> well, congratulations. So, uh, yeah, well, t well, since you brought that up, yeah, there are some naysayers who maybe, I know you talk about this a lot in the documentary. This is your fifth marriage. You talk, you're actually, like I said, quite vulnerable about talking about um, things that have gone wrong in the past in your personal life. So, and then Kat uh, is quite uh, open in this documentary as well. So let's talk about the fact that you were willing to go there and talk about that stuff amid talking about all your career highs. Sure, well, Kat is super evolved, evolved and um, we like to say that there's 10 things that can bring a marriage down. It could be geography, it could be finances, it could be children, it could be cheating, it could be, and there's so many things. Age difference, which we clearly have, is one of the 10. But if the other nine are solid, then you have a real shot at staying together. So uh, our other nine are really solid. And, um, you know, I, I this is a documentary about my life. So it, I just didn't want it to be like, and then he did, and then he did, and then he did. Cause like anybody, we don't need a talent like a Barry's caliber to do that. So Barry really grinded us. And to his credit, and I will say to my credit too, I let him do what I love to do, which is be a control freak in the studio. And I let <laughs> him be a control freak in the documentary. And I was allowed to make a suggestion or two, but it, I was never allowed to go like, take that out, I don't like that. That person is gone. I, mean, I, I Maybe he would have let me, I don't know, but I didn't want to, because I wanted it through his lens. I didn't want it through my lens, which I know my story like so well. I know every heartbeat of it. So I wanted his take on it. So if you relinquish the control in that way, I don't know, when did you see the several interviews that uh, Catherine did for this documentary where she she's pretty, um, outspoken about the challenges of being married to you and how getting you to communicate and things like that. I was very surprised by her candor. When did you react to that? And how did those interviews unfold 
in terms of the um, grinding, as you put it. I'm not sure if I have seen that. Have I seen that, Barry? Because I was the <laughs> link you sent me, I was never able to open it. Ever. Well, let me let me go back and say that the, the you know I I in in nearly 50 documentaries I've never been so nervous in my life to show a film to David and the deal was that he got to see it once and he flew to Toronto we sat in a in a screening room together in the dark and I said I'm really nervous and then he put me at a level of comfort and he goes I'm nervous too uh, and we watched it and we went for dinner after and he said look there's a lot of stuff in there I'm not comfortable with. But I know the rules. I know, you know, what you've been telling me for the last couple of years of what makes a great documentary. And so let's roll. And again, I've done a lot of these. Uh, David's access to talent and to his personal life was truly unprecedented. Uh, and we both are putting our reputations on the line for, with this film. And, and, and something that most people don't know is that after we showed the film at the Toronto Film Festival, it bothered both of us that we really hadn't covered a couple of key topics in, in the in the depth that I wanted. And to David's credit, and this has never been done, he said, let's go again. And we sat back down. So with a cat McPhee, remember we shot her the first time they were engaged, about to be married. Then we brought her back to film her after they were married. So, so I was able to say to her, so what's marriage like? You know, what are the challenges? What are the wins? And, and she was incredibly open and candid. So. You know, this worked. So wait, so David, you haven't seen a final cut. I You opened the movie saying you're a control freak, so it shocks me that you're being so laissez-faire about, about it. You know, that must have been something you had to, like, how did you get to that point where you're like, ah, oh, okay. Well, I mean, I know that Barry's a great filmmaker. I know the rules. You, you, you can't have your handprint, your fingerprint all over your documentary. It's just asinine. It's It, it makes you whatever the next level is of egotistical. Uh, and I didn't want to do that. So um, I, I have seen the documentary and I, I believe I've seen the director's cut too, right, Barry? You did. No, or that's what you sent to me and I could never open it. Oh no, but we, we had, a, we had a, a quick look in LA. That's right, in that, in the, on Sunset. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, compelling. And there was plenty that I would have loved to have seen taken out on a personal level, but I, Ooh, did, well, tell me that. What were the things that, if it were up to you, would have ended up on the cutting room floor? Um, some of the personal stuff. Some of the but personal I, stuff. I understand that, but I feel like that's why I started with this, is I feel that was the most compelling stuff for me because, you know, we can look at your Wikipedia page and know what you've done professionally, and it's obviously super impressive, and the stories are great, but this is the stuff that I think people don't necessarily so know about. Do you think it's more interesting for my wife to say that I can be difficult rather than Barbara Streisand <laughs> saying I can be difficult. Uh, I think they're both interesting in different, in different ways. I'm just saying like, it's not all documentaries allow that peek into the personal life. A lot of them are more just about the career highs and lows. So I appreciate it that there, there was a bit of both. I, 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 I will, I will tell you that the line at the top of the film where David does say with a, you know, tongue in cheek and with some bravado that I'm going to be all over you. It's, it's a bit of a thrown away misleader because that was truly the first interview that we did together. Although we spent a lot of time together, the chemistry wasn't established between us until we sat down in Capitol Records in that studio where everybody from Frank Sinatra to Dinah Washington performed. So it was emotional for David, for both of us. He did not know me as a director uh, on a personal level. And, and saw me film a little bit of them, B-roll and stuff, but to sit down there, and I don't use notes, and we sat there for five hours. And so I think, and David, you can confirm it, his trust and his opinion of me changed because he, he we, we'd spent time together, but this was really it. It was intimate, it was the two of us, six cameras, no notes. Yeah, no notes, very impressive. And um, yeah, your stock went way up that day. <laughs> Well, before I move on to the lightning round, I want just, um, it just sort of segues into that, but I did want to ask another thing about Kathy McPhee, because I know that you were a guest mentor, I believe on her season of American Idol, I'm a big American Idol fan. And um, I know she actually sang a song on American Idol that you, on the Greatest Love Songs uh, episode, I Have Nothing, which you co-wrote and you co-wrote with your ex-wife, Linda. And I'm, I'm curious, is that how you guys first met and became friends? I know the romance came later. 
Yeah, we met on Idol. I was a mentor, a guest guest judge on Idol, and that's when we met. And then we always stayed in touch and worked together, charity events. But, you know, I was married, she was married, and uh, we behaved. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I'm glad about that. But I'm I'm curious if there's like any kind of full circle moment that goes through your mind that she sang a song you wrote, one of your most iconic songs written for one of your most iconic artists you've worked with, written with um, a previous spouse. And it was on Love Songs Night. And then, you know, 14 years later, you're celebrating a, a year anniversary. That's that's like a love story. That's a biopic right there. Barry, direct the biopic for that. <laughs> Should be done. I don't think it's that deep. I mean, I, I don't think we put that much thought into it. But um, okay. how, where we ended up was pretty great. Pretty great. So let's talk about about Whitney. Um, I have mentioned uh, I have nothing, but I love the story in the movie about I will always love you, which um, because I, you know, I learned a lot about that in in the sense of uh, you had some misgivings about the recording of this one, about how about the intro and stuff, which I think is, well, you know, interesting. Yeah, that for sure. But to back up just slightly. Um, the original song that they picked was What Becomes of the Brokenhearted, you know. And I did a demo of it. I played it for Whitney. And she wasn't feeling it. I wasn't feeling it. I was like, oh. She said, please try again. I tried a second demo. Still wasn't feeling it. And I didn't know what to do because it just wasn't working for her. It's a good song, but not right for her. And then, uh, lo and behold, that song became a hit for Paul Young on the charts. And I ran to Kevin Costner feigning that I was upset when I was actually thrilled. Yeah. Kevin, we can't do this song. It's a hit now for Paul Young. Come up with another song. And he did. And that, will, I will, that was I Will Always Love You. But the part you're referring to is that I didn't want to do the first part a cappella, And he did. And he won. And he was right. And I was wrong. Why didn't you want that? I mean, was it because you didn't think it was like a risk for radio? Or what was your reasoning? It just didn't, you know, I'm a musician. I like to make music. <laughs> <laughs> um, when did you realize that this arrangement that when did you realize you had something special because they obviously it was something special because it's Whitney but like this was if I'm not mistaken the bodyguard is the number one selling soundtrack of all time and that was even though it's originally by Dolly it's kind of her it became her signature song when did Whitney. you realize um, you know, I mean I knew when I did the first demo the demo I knew right away I knew when I heard the song, I knew exactly what to do with it and how to, how to witnessify it, witnessify <laughs> it immediately. And the big boom and the thing I heard at the key change and the, you know, I got to do my thing. I got to be my bombastic self, which uh, everybody either hates or loves about me. But I got to do it and Whitney loved the demo. She was like, oh my God, this is incredible. I had my friend Nita Whitaker sing the demo and uh, Whitney loved it and we couldn't wait to record it. Lindsay, I'll, I'll tell you on, on that, if you want to understand the brilliance of David, that's the 101 song. If Diane Warren says in the film that that David imagines a standing ovation in at some point of a song. And when we were shooting at Capitol Records, you might remember I, I played back the song for David in the studio to get lost in again in that magnificent, you know, acoustic surrounding. And his songs... Are, are, are just, you know, they're cinematic. They, you just wait for that moment as there is in that song. Boom, 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 Psh, explosion. It's, it's huge. It's what's missing in a lot of music today because everything seems so uh, um, tech that you miss those moments of anticipation and go, wow, I get it. Where yeah. does that bombast come from? Because where, where Aesthetically, because you say it's like not everyone's cup of tea and there's some stuff in the documentary about some Chicago fans that weren't thrilled when you got involved and it changed their aesthetic. But where, where does that gravitation towards things that are big, you know, come from? I don't know, but it's honest and truthful. And, and so it's my truth. And just the same as when Neil Diamond writes a song and it's three chords and every song that he writes is about three or four chords and they're all amazing, but that's his truth, right? I couldn't do a three chord song, I don't think. I mean, my stuff is more complicated, but when I lay my hands on the keyboard, like right now, I have a piano in front of me. When I lay my hands on the keyboard, it's gonna be like this. It's not gonna be. It's not gonna be that. It's just not what I feel, you know? Okay. But, but David, don't you think that your classical training has some relevance? I mean, if you listen to some of the great 
composers in that work. It is, they do have some big moments. Absolutely. And there's only, there's only 12 notes. So we're just rearranging all the that's already been done from 300 years ago. <laughs> well, anytime you want to break into the keyboard during this interview, as we talk about other songs, I'm absolutely not going to stop you because I'm getting like a virtual David Foster concert, which is pretty okay. awesome. But you, you mentioned Barbara Streisand uh, a while back, and she was very instrumental in your early composing and production career. And, and she said, you said that uh, she thought you were difficult. Yeah. And by the way, Barry, I love the way you weaved my story with her story and the stories match up. I mean, like my, my, my story matches up with her story. So I wasn't imagining that she was like, Hey kid, what's that you're playing? I like that. You know, it's like right out of the movies. But um, what was your question again, Lindsay? The, what's the Barbara Streisand story about how, because even though she said you were difficult, it obviously was a fruitful partnership that really put your career into the stratosphere. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, Barbara is uh, very particular in the studio as you can imagine she's barbara streisand she's an amazing director amazing actor amazing singer and um you know if you're gonna if you're gonna go up against her or not against her but you know try and make her better than the last guy you really be uh, you have to be on your game and um we've had a great 40-year friendship um that doesn't happen with everybody i work with in fact we don't work we haven't worked together probably in 20 years i don't think but we still have a friendship and um she's barbara streisand she's iconic and she's amazing. Well, why did she say you were difficult, though? Because I am difficult. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, let's talk about um, Celine Dion and other... Oh, wait, uh, sorry, let me just back up for a second. Sure. Making records is not a democracy. It is for some people. They Producers, and they can get results. They lay on the sofa and they go, I like that. Work on that. That's not me. It's not a democracy. So that gets me into a lot of trouble. Um, I was really disappointed, Barry, about, because I had a, you know, a pretty rough time with the group Chicago, even though we had a lot of success together. And you know, to their credit, they were right in that I had changed their sound. They were superstars before I came along. And they didn't like, a lot of them didn't like the way I changed their sound. So I said to Barry, you got to go interview Chicago because they are going to like destroy me in this interview. They're going to like just shit all over me because they hate me. <laughs> and then Barry, he, he did it. And they were like, nice. They were nice. Like, come yeah. on, guys. They walked into a room at the, the, the story was, they walked in the room and they went, yeah, it's the greatest thing that I ever, that ever happened to us. And I said, your liner notes say that he destroyed your lives. Yes, they put it in print. So they, they, they do end up talking about, I mean, they, they, they talk about the process being very difficult, that yeah. it, it, David's right. It was autocratic. He removed certain uh, sounds and whatnot and relegated legendary musicians to standing in the shadows. Uh, but, uh, and it was tough for them, but they ultimately realized that that's where they needed to go. And as David says in the film, he gave them their legacy and their, and their, uh, uh, work for the next. Well, their second legacy. I mean, they and had, their royalties, they dude. They their had royalties. a beautiful legacy before me. That's yeah. true. But their second legacy. And by the way, this is not covered in the documentary, Barry and Lindsay. But I was particularly hard on their drummer, Danny Serafin. And in fact, because of me, he lost a lot of confidence. And mm -hmm. I just recently, about a year ago, two years ago, wrote him a very long email uh, apologizing to him. Mm -hmm. He reached out back to me and it was like, he, he was just so happy that I had written that apology. So it was nice. Aww. That's cool. Well, I mentioned the Celine Dion thing because there's a similar scene in that where she talks about a time when you just made her sing something over and over again. What was that song? What was that situation? Obviously, it got results. I think it was All By Myself, which is one of the, high, it's the, one of the highest notes that any human has ever sung. But the point is that when I ask a singer, just like Barry, when Barry says, OK, I said, are we done, Barry? No, we're not quite done but you've asked me for five hours questions. Yeah, but I just got a couple more. You know? He's not doing that because he wants to sit there and listen to my bull. He's doing that to make a better documentary. So when I ask a singer to sing it five more times, I'm not doing it for my pleasure. I don't want to be sitting there while they sing the same line over and over. I'm doing it because I want to make a better record. And so it's for them. It's their picture on the front, not mine. So, Barry, I know you can relate to that. 
Well, I, well, and you hear something and you know they can go another note higher or get a better take, absolutely. And even in filmmaking, one question does lead to another and those insights, for sure, for sure. You understood that too. Yeah. Another song I want to talk about with um, a wonderful female singer is Natalie Cole, because now these sort of virtual things happen all the time. We have holograms, we do interviews on Zoom or Skype, but it was very groundbreaking, the unforgettable duet, the posthumous duet with her father it won a bunch of Grammys. But at the time, no one had seen anything like this. Um, tell me a bit about how that idea came up, because I feel it really kind of changed the game. Yeah, it was uh, done in, what, 1991, I think, maybe. So the technology was, like, really sketchy back then. There was no technology that would allow such a thing. So myself and Dave Wrights, the engineer at the time, and Umberto Gatica, we had to really put our brains together and, and try and figure out how to technologically pull this off. Um, but when I got that tape of Nat King Cole, and I soloed it, even though there was a lot of leakage on the vocal, and you know, he, he recorded on a microphone that we still beg to use today. You know, they're 50 years old, these microphones, but they're, you know, they cost $50,000 and you, that's what we still use today. His vocal is so, it was like silk. And I just put that fader up and I was like, oh my, God, this is this is just amazing. So I figured out how to um, put the whole thing together. But what happened is that um, there was three producers on that record because there was 22 songs. Mm -hmm. And we all went to Dupar's restaurant and we put all 22 songs on the table for lunch. And we just started picking the songs that we liked. And I picked Unforgettable. I said, oh, I love that song. I want to do that. Nobody said anything. Her husband was one of the producers, Natalie's husband at the time. Nobody said anything, so I got to do Unforgettable. And then when we went to record it or talk about it pre-production, she said, by the way, I want Unforgettable to be a duet with my father. I was like, really? I picked, like, I just won the lotto. You know, I just I picked the song that I love, not having any idea that it was going to be a duet. So it was her idea to do the duet. Wow. Um, another uh, thing I want to talk about, because um, I don't know if this is covered in the documentary, but yesterday or the day before we're doing this interview, was the 35th anniversary of St. Almost Fire. Hmm. And obviously you were involved with the theme song and um, the score, which I did not know about, I will admit, I just recently discovered that. And also obviously very sadly, Joel Schumacher just passed. What are your memories of working on that film? Cause that was like right at the zeitgeist of Den X. Rat -pack. memories but I, I don't want to take up a lot of time uh and, and i and i have a question for barry too on that but um joel schumacher was so fantastic and i was uh dicking around not delivering on time um and he used a line on me that i just love and i use it to this day he was very excitable always you know he's just he was such a beautiful guy and i came I, and i said you know i haven't gotten to that cue yet because of this and the kid or whatever and, you know, he said look david I am not put on this earth to be your disciplinarian. You either get the work done or you don't. And I just love that line. I'm not here to be your disciplinarian. Oh, it's just brilliant on so many levels. And he, he was really fantastic. And he had a, quite a body of work too. Absolutely. But that film for people of a certain age, for people who are squarely falling in Gen X, that was along with uh, the John Hughes films or the, rap, uh, the Brat Pack Breakfast films Club. that were coming out. Yeah. Yeah, all of them really just captured a moment. So I'm wondering when you recorded the music for it, you know, what were you influenced by? It was, you know, 85, smack dab in the 80s. Yeah. Well, I remember calling my friend Tom Scott, who is a great saxophonist and composer himself and great musician. And I said, Tom, I'm scoring my first movie. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I've found this theme that seems to work a lot throughout the movie. It seems to work like in 10 different places in different ways. I said, is that good or is that bad? And I really didn't know. So when you take it like in a tender moment, and you pause and he's going, if you found something that can work all the way through the movie, you've just cracked the code. So. And you did, you yeah. did. My question for oh. Barry, Lindsay was, I have one complaint about the documentary. And I'm not a complaint, but a, a note, not a note, a, uh, yeah, a note. Why didn't you put more of my failures in the documentary? 
or why didn't you want to talk about that? Uh, it, it, that question almost seems like a, like a setup. Like now I'm supposed no. to. Well, I couldn't find it. Question. It's a good question. No, I mean honestly, it's it's it bothers me because I've had way more failures than successes. Well, that's completely untrue. This, this is the Canadian insecurity coming in, which, which I'm part of uh, on, that, on that end of it. I don't, David, I, I, in the storytelling on the side of it, I didn't find the failures uh, that cinematic, for the lack of a better word. Uh, they're, they're failures in, in your mind, but if you get into the specifics about why they failed, I just thought the successes were 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 more interesting as well as some of the drama in your life and of course the, the 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 greatest one of the greatest stories of all which makes it into the cut that the world is now going to see is the ben vereen story which did not make it into the film that we showed at the toronto film festival mm -hmm. yeah so, let's talk about that and since you brought it up because when i mentioned at the top of this interview david there would definitely be some things that personal things that would be tough i can imagine that's at the top of that list. How did it feel to tell that story and to see that story on the on the screen? And yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I've sort of distanced myself from the story personally now because it's been so many years. <clears throat> so I can sort of be objective about it. I'll tell you that the night that I hit Ben Marine, that night and the next day or two after that were the worst days of my life other than when my father died. It was absolutely worse. And I never believed in flashbacks until that happened. And for three days, every 20 seconds or 30 seconds, I hit Ben Vereen in my brain. And I would go like that for three days. It was insane. I thought I was going to have to go to the hospital. And of course, he and I were friends. And uh, there's a long story about why he was out in the road at 2.30 in the morning. Sorry? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my wife. Covering my ass. Um, <laughs> Good one. Um, yeah, I was not. I had not been drinking, uh, but he had had an earlier accident, and it, I think the story is in the documentary. He, he was, yeah, he he was in the middle of the road because he was having something. He was having some kind of brain issue. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but we were friends, and uh, you know, his his recovery was my recovery. So as he started getting better, and I thought I, I thought I'd killed him for sure, but as he started getting better, I started getting better, and then three months later, as it says in the documentary, I think um, he called up. He goes, David Foster. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, it's one of your greatest hits ever. Just, <laughs> just leveled it, you know, and made everything okay. You know, yeah, but it, obviously it was ugly. Sense of humor. Yeah, it's great. Well, didn't you say, though, in a weird thing, so without going too much into it, he'd had some kind of brain issue, which was why he was in the middle of the road. But in a weird way, the fact that he was hit and had to go to the hospital Save uncovered him. that. Yeah. So it saved him in a strange way, right? It, Am I getting it, that story it, it, right? Yes, and he believes that wholeheartedly, and it's, I think, the truth. They scanned his whole body and found that six-hour-old subdural hematoma and that he would have been dead by 7 a.m., uh, bleeding in the brain. So wow. he credits me with that, which is just the weirdest way to save somebody. There, there, you no, know, the interesting thing, Lindsay, with this film is that, at, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you get tired of watching it over and over and over and over. And, he, and I'm not saying because Dave is on the line. It's fun. You know, I, we watched it with an audience of nearly 2,000 in Toronto. You don't necessarily get to watch films with a live audience anymore, certainly not now. So it was it was thrilling to sort of watch them get lost in iconic songs that David was a part of and also uh, the, some of the vulnerabilities of him as well. But, you know, those moments are my favorites. And then, uh, and, I, and really that candid moment of David at the piano with Kat to come full circle where, and he says in the film, these are some of my favorite moments when I'm at the piano that he's at right now with Kat and they just perform as they've been doing online. It's quite wonderful to see that chemistry, not only in a relationship, but in, in the symmetry of talent. Wow, so that's yeah. kind of fun. Well, before we wrap up, I have a couple of questions to tack on to that because on, on a fun note, David, you say that there weren't enough of your failures. I'm doing this with my hands, air quotes, failures. What's your biggest failures? Like, you know, like what are the ones that you would have wanted in the documentary if uh, if that had been a longer different? Well, I mean, when I decided to be a record producer, for instance, I gave up being a studio musician. I was making six figures a year in the 70s as a studio musician. That's a lot of money. And I gave it all up to produce because I didn't figure you could do it half-assed. 
My first three albums that I produced all were colossal favorite failures. J.P. Morgan, the Keen Brothers, and Bill Champlin. Heard of them? No. I've heard of uh, Bill Champlin for sure. Yeah. Okay. Actually, that, that was uh, Verve, and that actually was in the first cut uh, of the film on that end of it and got cut oh, for yeah. time at the end of the day because, all right, well, uh, you, you, but interesting, interesting story. Yeah, and so, so rough on me, so hard on me uh, personally that I thought, well, I thought producing records was my calling, but I, I guess it's not. I mean, you make three records in a row that takes a year, at least a year and a half to do three albums at that, back in those days. So a year and a half of my time is like, I have nothing to show for it, except a bunch of failures. And then Earth, Wind and & Fire and Cheryl Lynn and Alice Cooper and Chicago and everything, you know, Kenny Rogers and Chaka Khan, it just all exploded over a- Yeah, you made up, you made, we couldn't fit all your successes in the movie, so certainly couldn't, uh, <laughs> you know, fit in the disproportionately smaller number of failures. There's a couple more things I want to ask about because I just very recently did an interview. I've been covering 1985, going back to the year 1985, the year of kind of uh, benefit singles. There was We Are the World. Very shortly before that, there was Band Aid, which kicked it off. Live Aid happened that year. And then there was Hearing Aid, uh, which I've talked to Metal, which was like the Metal We Are the World. There was uh, the Sun City um, oh, song yeah. that. Oh, yeah. going to play Sun City. But a lot of people, you know, south of the uh, Canadian border don't necessarily know about the kind of Canadian We Are the World that you did. And it's in the documentary, it's fascinating because it's like a who's who of Canadian stars. Can you talk real quick about, about that mm -hmm. song? Sure, I mean, Quincy Jones, who did We Are the World actually called me uh, and said, hey, you're the perfect candidate to do this in Canada. We're doing it here, you do it up there. So I called Bruce Allen, who manages Brian Adams. Brian Adams and Jim Valance and I got together and wrote the song in one night. Nine days after Quincy called me, we were in Toronto making the record. and rightfully so we had everybody we had Joni Mitchell we had Ann Murray we had Neil Young we had Oscar Peterson we had Loverboy we had Rush we had everybody it was the most amazing thing and that's where I classically told Neil Young that he was singing out of tune when I was producing him and he goes that's my sound man I'm, is that in the documentary Barry it is isn't it I think so yeah it's a good story. It's a good story. Well, I'm, I thank you very much for your time. You guys have been very generous with your time. But to wrap it up with sort of what we were talking about at the beginning of the interview, because Barry, you brought up the chemistry between Kat and, and, and David and what you've witnessed. Um, how did you celebrate your anniversary, David, that happened just yesterday? In pure classic COVID style. <laughs> Can't go anywhere. Um, managed to get flowers. I managed to get a gift for her just all Aww. without going out. And um, we had takeout from our favorite restaurant, Craig's. No, I missed that. Yeah. That's a good point. So it was a you do cool. discuss in the documentary how you've sort of, run, I'm using your words, but run from other marriages when they got tough or whatever. Like, what have you learned from those? Because it seems like, as you said at the top of this interview, you and Kat have such a solid foundation. She's even looking out for you during this interview. What have you learned that you're applying now that's making this work? Well, you know what I'm going to say about that? The documentary's on Netflix starting July 1st. Watch Ooh, it. Don't forget that's it. I love this, man. <laughs> Mic drop. drop. You are a professional. I appreciate that. It is a great documentary. And yes, there's a lot of candid stories, a lot of fun stories, a lot of serious stories. It is called Off the Record. Thank you so much, guys. It has been a treat and an honor to speak with you both. David Foster's Barry Averich directed documentary Off the Record is available July 1st on Netflix. I heartily recommend it. And thank you for watching this, everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.